Um, yeah, I'm pleased to talk about this new uh, instrument that, that we've um, very happy about because it has the law of dimensions so we can play around with it and uh, we hope it will help us to get us to the clinic, which we're very interested in, as uh, I was already talking about yesterday. Um, so today I, I will show, I will repeat some of the things that I showed you yesterday, but maybe a little bit different context. And also, uh, I'm gonna give you a couple of few stories to show uh, how this um, instrument changes, how, uh, how we can do projects. <laughs> I should also say, uh, we have a, an active uh, Twitter account, so uh, you can all follow that, so uh, to hear what's going on in the lab. Yeah, so, and we have, um, and that's for the two labs in um, Copenhagen and in, in Munich. <clears throat> okay, so this is a history of, um, of um, our work with Buka, just for historical interest. We um, used to only work with Thermo, but then Thermo closed the um, Odense side of Ole Worm, and I'm very good friends with Ole Worm, and then he suggested we should work with, um, or at least look into Bruca because they had some really exciting technology, because he was going to Bruca, and that's how we, um, how this all came about, and that's, uh, that's already five years ago now. So then we, uh, uh, we worked, uh, so in Annette Mikalski started this in the lab, and then Scarlett was actually now working at Bruca. So we started uh, characterizing this impact time of flight instrument, and then um, and, and then uh, moved on to the passive and the current instrument that I'm talking about today. So as I already discussed, so we can have um, peptides or metabolites of the same mass, of the, exactly the same composition, but they have different shape, then they can be separated by ion mobility, and this is, um, this is an old story. Um, and <coughs> um, this has existed for a long time, but um, um, the new thing is that it's in a very accessible format now, uh, that, that you can really use it in, uh, in a robust way in proteomics. And, and this is this TIMS device here that you've already heard several times about. And this is, the, um, this is developed by Mel Parks uh, of Wuka. And what it does is uh, it, it uh, spatially segregates the ions here in a 14 centimeter device. Uh, and this is in two parts so that we can have 100% UD cycles. So while the separation happens here and the illusion, they can be um, they can be accumulated here. Um, so the ions are like some centimeters apart from each other and then you, you let them out by, um, um, by lowering this potential here. So that's the basic idea. And then um, depending on uh, the peptides, so for instance, phosphopeptides with the phosphor group in different locations may or may not have um, a different ion mobility. Um, so, or, or peptides that are uh, sequenced or that, that have exactly the same mass, they may have different mobilities. So this is, um, this is the instrument, this is the team also, Florian and Andreas and uh, Catherine uh, working on different aspects of Florian has been uh, heading this a bit. Um, and um, I've also pointed out and others that the, uh, the LC time and the um, uh, this ion mobility time and, um, um, and, and then the, the mass spec fragmentation time, I get the actual mass spec, they are perfectly uh, separate or uh, perfectly nested, so we can, um, we can put them perfectly together, so the chromatography can be just as fast as it wants and it still uh, fits to ion mobility separation and, and very fast um, data acquisition here. Um, so then that's again the passive idea. So uh, you lower here as, as the peptides come out uh, of, the, um, of this, the end of this TIMS tunnel, uh, we very quickly position the quadrupole uh, to 
each of the positions. So we showed this principle a couple of years ago, but it was kind of uh, in, uh, done by hand or like, um, like in infusions, and then it took a couple of years to really put that into an instrument, and, um, and, and now it's working very well, and uh, you can really get uh, from once what you normally get one MSMS from, you get, get, can get 12 from, uh, and, and uh, again, the, all the ions that are captured uh, can also be converted into fragment ions. So that's, uh, that's the principle, and uh, that has far-reaching um, <clears throat> far effects. And also one way to think about it is uh, the ion mobility, mobility is good, um, but in many ways we're using the ion mobility section as an ion handling device rather than only a separation device. So then if you do the actual experiments, then uh, uh, the ion, the way the quadrupole travels from one precursor to another can be quite um, complicated. So uh, of course it has to travel to them uh, to the precursors as they come out, so uh, according to the mobility, um, but uh, it can take different paths here, and that, that can be an um, interesting challenge to do this in an optimal way. So that's also incorporated partially in the software. Uh, and this is an illustration here. If you, so here's again the ion mobility dimension, this is the MSMS dimension. So if you have, um, so there's the point here of co-eluting ions that have precursor ions that have the same mass. So um, they would actually they project onto the same um, uh, onto the same uh, precursors in a normal MS spectrum where you didn't have the ion mobility. But then now we know this and we can catch the ions. Um, you know, in one scan this one, another scan this one and they're completely different MSMS -MS spectra, so you can catch both, uh, which would have been hard, and this would be one of those chimeric spectra otherwise. So this is then, uh, then we started to have these um, production instruments, 2018, and now we have actually um, quite a number of them, so we have five of them in, in Munich, and um, one of them in Copenhagen, and now we are putting the EVOCEPs in front of them for, uh, um, for the robustness, because then we have a super robust HPLC system, and this is also very robust, so we don't need to clean these instruments. And that, that's also very important if we want to go into the clinic and be able to correlate all the patient data across, regardless of the time that we've um, measured them. So then, yeah, and the, so these two things together, what we want of them and what is also the case, it's scalable and auto robust. And so um, uh, we basically have here the EVOSEP and then we have um, different ways to do the chromatography uh, separation and then it goes into the source here and then it's, um, it's, it's the um, bioinformatic analysis. So I already showed this yesterday um, but just again to remind people that the principle here is that you uh, have the uh, um, preformed. So these these here pumps are uh, operating at a microliter per minute uh, flow rate. So they quickly make this gradient in uh, a preformed gradient. And then this this here column is actually four meters long. Uh, and but it has this aspect ratio, right? So there's no diffusion uh, um, <clears throat> because it's it's very thin. And then, uh, and then you pump this out. So and yesterday I didn't explain what is this for. So that's because uh, when you preform them here, the gradient, they just separated by the Evo tip here. This is like a stage tip. So the peaks are actually broad. So the peptides are embedded here and they're in, um, in these different, I mean, in, in the correct position in the gradient, but they're quite broad. So, uh, so and th then here you have the analytical column. Uh, and this will sharpen them up just in, like in a normal HPLC. Um, but if we didn't have these pumps here, then the peptides wouldn't actually stop here. They would just run through. And that's why uh, these uh, syringe pumps are necessary. So they just offset um, the organic content a little bit so that uh, peptides actually stop here and, uh, and, are, then, uh, and are then sharpened. So that, that's the principle here and again, 
Uh, this is all low flow, and this is the only high, high pressure pump, uh, which makes it again very, um, that, that makes it very robust. And yeah, so this is my disclaimer here. Um, so we, and, and now this is just the principle for this ultra robust uh, and, and very sensitive workflow. Um, but uh, then what can we do with them? And we, we now starting to measure large scale cancer projects on them. Uh, so that's ongoing and we see very good results. So we have the cancer patients and then we have, uh, uh, we have like HeLa between and the HeLa gives us always the same identification over time with no change. So here um, we uh, have this project which I already introduced yesterday. So we wanna do the uh, yeast interactome again and then the human interactome. Uh, and here uh, we use the EvoSet method which gives you 60 samples per day, uh, so that's a 21 minute gradient. And, um, and then we have it here on the Tim's top. And this is some uh, example of epigenetic complexes. So that's the bait and we get, uh, we get pretty complete or we get complete coverage of the complexes. And the ones that we don't get, they're also controversial in the literature. So we don't, we believe they're actually not members of the complex. So, um, and, the, um, and this is also maybe instructive for um, people to think because we have a tendency to, or we have to publish in academia, we have to publish these things when, when they're hardly possible, right? I mean, otherwise somebody else will publish them and, and, uh, in nature and then you cannot publish them anymore. And the unfortunate effect of that is that then it's very hard to revisit them because you cannot get grant uh, money um, uh, for that. And this is the case for the yeast interactome or, or the human interactome as well. Um, so uh, we then wanted to say, okay, let's take this technology and this is now quite feasible with a single PhD student and, and let's do it correctly now. So, and then, uh, yeah, we had a, we, um, a part of two back-to-back -back papers in Nature in 2002 about the yeast interactome and then there was this paper by Greenblatt in 2006 and now we wanna do this again. So they, they were using tab tagging um, and now we use uh, GFP tag in, in a clever way. That's from the Jonathan Weissman lab also, like also here. Um, and uh, that's interesting because at that point they uh, used four liters of, you know, for every single pull down, right? And now we need 1.5 milliliters, but that's complete overkill still. So um, uh, yeah, and, so, and I think this is a lesson for many things now as uh, you know, we can do things with 100 times less material, this opens up for a lot of things and also with the throughput on the mass spec. Yeah, and this allows us to do the entire library. So um, I'll show later where we are. So that's um, uh, under, um, who has done this, the student. So he's set up this very nice protocol. Uh, and then I mean, that took most of the time actually to set up the protocol, latest and greatest. And then these are, different, um, uh, these are different uh, complexes. So this uh, uh, test pull-downs for nuclear complex. And what you wanna see is rectangles here and we see rectangles. So, um, and these are membrane complexes. So not that you when know, people do bio ID and APEX, they always say a, um, you know, APMS cannot do membrane complex, but that's actually not true. So uh, not every membrane complex, yes, but, but by and large you can get them too. And we get very clean data for them as well. So that's shown here. Um, so we, we do get what, um, what you would expect in quite a, a, a clean way. So then this is the student now is um, taking the library and growing them up, but you don't need to grow them up very much and, and um, uh, store them at minus 80. And he started the measurements on June 21st. And then uh, uh, they are all in 96 well um, uh, plates. So he's, um, uh, this is a couple of weeks ago. So he's at, he was at box 32 out of the 44. And uh, of the 2,980 um, pull downs, only two didn't work for some reason that actually had nothing to do with the mass spec. Um, so and then yeah, this, is, um, this is the data and you know, this is the max one, which definitely blows up the data. So that needs to be worked on. Uh, this is also interesting, so we use the PEP map column, or PEP SEP column, sorry. Uh, so this is a relatively short column here, 
And this is after these six weeks, so the pressure is only increased by 17 bars. So as far as the column is concerned, it could run for another 50 weeks, which is much longer than the, it will take to finish, finish actually the interactome. So the whole interactome can presumably be done on this one column also. So, and this is uh, Andre here, who's doing this, and these are his boxes as he's doing uh, by himself this whole in interactome. So, and here, uh, you know, he stacked them up in his office, and this is a doctor hat, which we have in Germany, so when, when he's reached the ceiling here, he can actually graduate. So, <laughs> so then we are doing this to get a very good data set, and we hope we can then really say something about the topology of an interaction network for the first time with quite complete data in the yeast, which only has one cell type and so on. But of course, the interest, more interesting thing is the human interactome. And here we, we're teaming up with the John Zuckerberg uh, biohub here in, in San Francisco. And this is technology from Jonathan Weissman. Again, this, um, so the, this is split GFP system that he adapted. And um, so this clicks together with the GFP. It's a really nice, um, nice system for the bait. And then he's, of course, um, um, engineering with uh, a, a CRISPR uh, these tags, or just this piece of the tag, into all human open reading frames. Right? And then, uh, and, and this is going to be part of this open cell here. And uh, also, they're using Neo Green. So actually, even the um, so we're actually more sensitive than uh, the fluorescence. Right? That's also interesting. If if people always say that um, that um, proteomics not not sensitive. So, and that's also interesting. So we had a paper in Cell on the human interactome, where we also, it was quantitative and so on and so on, very good. Um, uh, but this also took us a long time. And now with the newest technology on this platform, we actually, we need uh, 40 times uh, less material. And that's again, still overkill. So we can do this in, uh, in a multiplex format now. Uh, and um, yeah, again, um, by a single student. And the data are very good. Uh, so these are the volcano plots for the interactions. This is a data matrix. Uh, it also is a new take on this question of DDA, you know, has all these missing values. Uh, that's true to a degree. But if the instrument is very, very fast, this so, um, so it's not like it's not getting around to picking the precursors, right? Because it's so fast. So we get actually very, uh, very, very complete uh, data matrices. So DI passive, I just want to talk about this a little bit. So as I already mentioned yesterday, and as Hannes is going to talk about more, uh, now the idea is to, um, uh, to use the DI principle, but, but then to follow again the, um, um, the peptides as they come out. So follow them with the quadrupole uh, and uh, use most of that ion current, so which you can use up to 100%. But, but if we have some selectivity, it's maybe 25% or, or something. So that, um, that then allows us to, um, yeah, so if I compare to DIA, so DIA, you have to make the cycles fast enough. So you, uh, uh, you sample this, and that is like two, three seconds, depending on the number of your, uh, the, uh, the number of your windows. Uh, but here it gets actually sampled every, depending on how, how many um, windows we have, it gets sampled every 100 milliseconds. So certainly much faster. So then this is how this can be done. And then we, this is just one of the early ways to cover the, the doubly charged species. So that, that was together with Hannes, who's talking next, and also Ben and, and Rudy. Um, so and the, the results are quite good, but this is early days. I think this will even uh, increase quite a bit. And I already mentioned this. So uh, yesterday, so Catherine, together with Florian, they are uh, work on lipidomics, and then we're going to work on metabolomics. Uh, and again, the advantage here is the very fast sequencing speed um, and the fact that we uh, need much, much less material than, than before. So then, then uh, uh, this is both uh, a work, ongoing work on the EvoSet platform and on the TIMS platform that should get us still higher sensitivity so we have these common methods here uh, you know, um, that makes everything very reproducible and, and easy. And then uh, 
Uh, we're now going also to the longer gradients here and lower flow rates and very low flow rates for the high sensitivity. Um, and again, that works because we are preforming the gradient in here and then uh, we can actually choose the, uh, the flow rate to anything we want here without having to make a binary gradient with two pumps. And also we get this, uh, the peptides in a very small volume from the tip here where we can also process the samples in, in one pot. And, and so the stability and so on is very good. So we're still working on uh, the volume so you can have no, uh, no, no large volume up front because they will take forever to come out and that's the case still here. So the peptides only loot at uh, uh, um, 50 minutes here, uh, but then they come out very reproducible still. So the principle works, I would say. So very, um, very uniform here and quantitatively uh, are very nice, um, but it still needs some engineering for the loop size and the volume. And this is the ongoing work on the Buka, where I already said um, we actually increase the intensity of the features by uh, almost fivefold, and then that multiplies with the improvements due to the lower uh, flow rate. So um, we, we are looking then together at at least an, an order of magnitude improved sensitivity, and that's also early days, um, but we can get uh, quite deep. And what I didn't say yesterday, so if we're going into the direction of single cell sequencing, then one advantage that proteomics has is that, um, uh, you know, as we get the technology better and better, we can then measure more and more of the protein. So this already con uh, compares very favorably to transcriptomics, uh, not so much for the technical reason, and again, we still don't have the barcode, but a single cell only has so many transcripts. So in single cell transcriptomics, they can measure 0.01 transcript, right? But that means only every 100 cells has it, whereas the protein, every cell tends to have the full complement of proteins. So long term, that's going to be a big advantage of proteomics, I think. So um, yeah, and that's still very uh, reproducible here. And again, we can get quite a number of proteins and that's increasing as we speak with uh, what corresponds to those four HeLa cells. So then as an, uh, uh, again, as I already showed you yesterday in the cancer context, um, where we're going with this, and let's just to close here, there's also a cool uh, application. So what's this? These are um, these transparent mice. So we do this um, together with Professor Ertürk, here Ali Ertürk, who is next to our institute, and Andreas is doing this in my lab. Um, and these are transparent mice. So these are normal mice before, then they're sacrificed, and then you, um, you have a complicated protocol uh, that makes them actually completely transparent. It's like quite creepy when you look at that and you really don't see them on the lab bench. <laughs> so you have to shave off the fur, of course, but then they are very transparent. And you can still see, see the eyes. So and why is that useful? I mean, you can, they typically combine that with GFP technology. So for instance, if you have a xenograft of a tumor, uh, then you, uh, that can be GFP tagged. And then you can also inject an antibody which is also tagged, fluorescent. And then you can localize in the entire mouse where did the antibody find the micrometastases, right? And then you can cut it out and we can do proteomics on it. So that's where I want to go with this. But here I just want to show that this works. So, um, so this is our mouse, so it's shaven and organs are isolated and tissues are cleared. Uh, and then you do this light sheet imaging, so you get a complete um, record of, of that organ. And then it, it can be reconstructed and we have to take uh, physical slices of it and then we go to the laser capture that I already introduced yesterday uh, and then we can cut out anything we want like these for instance the xenograph micro um, uh, uh, metastases where the antibody did or did not find the micro metastases and then we um, have to do the sample reparation and analyze so now the big question is is this actually compatible with proteomics because this is even worse than FFPE this is like the harshest treatment you could imagine. Uh, and indeed, um, uh, we, we can uh, do this. And um, so, um, so from a small amount of, of tissue, we can actually uh, get a good, uh, good number of proteins identified. Um, and um, 
yeah, then we compare the fresh versus this uh, method. So there's different methods around. This particular one is called vDisco. Um, and then here we go through all this. And that's, again, also very nice with the instrument. So we had, had then these eight days with these 30 samples. But, but uh, you know, with the HeLa runs, there was no difference at all in the number of proteins in, in the HeLa uh, proteome. So, um, and then this is some uh, outlier analysis of the different preparation methods. And the take home here is that, so they are outliers and they are uh, from the blood system. So that makes sense, right? Because uh, when you make them transparent and, and then you wash them and, and so on, then, then you have less blood than in the fresh sample. So that's uh, uh, what that is. But, but then if we're looking for proteins in brain that we're interested in, they actually uh, on the middle line in the volcano plot or GPCRs in the middle line. So they haven't been affected by this, um, um, by making the, the mice transparent. So we're working on some, together with these collaborators, on some cool applications of this. And just so take home, I've, I hope you've finished your lunch already. So this also works in humans. So you can actually also make human body parts transparent if you want. So that's... Um, not the whole human, but parts of the human. So that you can also do proteomics in that same way on, on it. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge specifically the um, Tim's uh, talk team here and our collaborators. It's been a lot of fun uh, to work with, uh, uh, with the Buka people on this. They're very responsive. These are our deep sequencing that I talked about yesterday, collaborators, and then collaboration now with um, um, Woody's lab and Ben's and the Rush lab. So thanks for your attention. Could you elaborate on that part of that single cell RNA seq and single cell protein? What's the advantage of each technology? Um, yeah, so disadvantage of doing it by proteomics is that we don't have this barcoding. So, um, um, so I mean, you can do TMT or something like that, and then you could have 16 at once. So we don't have this advantage of massive multiplexing, right? So that's this advantage. But then an advantage is that uh, we actually um, know where we are in the tissue. So typically, at least now, the RNA-seq is done by disaggregating the tissue, and you've lost now the spatial information, so people working on getting a handle on that. Uh, but right now that's not possible. But the, the fundamental biological uh, thing that I was alluding to was that um, there's, there are, I mean, there's a high amplification factor from the, um, uh, uh, from the message to the protein. So we addressed this quantitatively in uh, a liver proteome that we did uh, published a couple of years ago. And there we saw there was a factor even 10,000 between the like one, one mRNA copy, so in a post-mitotic tissue like liver, uh, one message gave rise to an average 10,000 protein copies. And, and then now the uh, RNA-seq people may run, I mean, I'm happy to be corrected, but biologically you run up against this problem that these cells actually don't have even a single copy of, your, um, of, um, of the gene, right? The gene is being expressed, but only sporadically, and there's some noise canceling in the cells, but at any given point of time, it doesn't actually have the, uh, the message and then you also cannot sequence it. But it still has hundreds of copies of the protein. So I think long-term that could be an advantage of doing it on protein. Plus another advantage is that we are not limited to single cells, right? We can analyze anything we want, only the membrane, only the mitochondria in due time. And this you cannot do with deep sequencing. Okay, let's thank uh, Matthias.